committee will come to order. Good morning, and thank you for being here. There are some small signs that the nation as a whole is beginning to emerge from the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. But it is way too early to declare victory. Unemployment is still sky high, and the home foreclosure crisis is growing unabated. For the homeowner who is underwater, the economic crisis certainly is not over. When you are behind in your mortgage payments, when the bank starts calling you each and every day, when you lie awake at night wondering, how are you going to explain to your children that you must move? You can start to feel like you really are drowning. And too many people know that this feeling. Last year, 2.8 million households received a notice of foreclosure. Almost 4 million homeowners are late on their mortgage payments by 90 days or more as this discussion is moving forward. And the problem is predicted to get worse. As many as 2.4 million people could lose their homes by foreclosure by the end of this year. To its great credit, the Obama administration recognized early on that an important part of the nation's economic recovery is keeping as many people as possible in their homes. This makes sense from both an economic standpoint and a public policy standpoint. The Home Affordable Modification Program, known as HAMP, is a central piece of Treasury Treasury's effort to carry out that objective. But a year after the creation of HAMP, only 170,000 households have received permanent mortgages modifications. This appears to be extremely low. We continue to hear numerous reports of borrowers who want to participate in HAMP, but just don't know where to begin. If they do begin, they often encounter unresponsive lenders, repeated incidents of lost paperwork, phone calls not being returned, and a variety of other administrative frustrations. To make matters worse, there is evidence that some vulnerable homeowners, desperate to obtain help, are falling victims to foreclosure rescue scams. Instead of obtaining house, housing assistance for free through a legitimate housing counselor, these homeowners owners are being fleeced by scam artists posing as professionals. In addition, a new survey by the National Community Reinvestment Coalition provides evidence that minorities, particularly African Americans, may be less likely to receive a mortgage modification under HAMP and are more likely to be foreclosed on. This is just not acceptable. Moreover, this problem is compounded by the fact that HAMP still does not have a clear process by which a homeowner can appeal a denial of his or her application. These problems are reflected in the program's results as reported by Treasury and SIGTAR. The Mortgage Bankers Association says that HAMP and other government programs have made significant strides in stabilizing the housing finance, financing system and have assisted many people who otherwise would have lost their homes. But clearly we need to do a whole lot better. There can be legitimate debate over the numerical goals of the HAMP program. But the central issue we need to understand is why fewer than 200,000 homeowners have obtained so-called permanent modifications under the HAMP program and what we can do to increase the number. We cannot afford a lot of time to study the problem. We need to have a sense of urgency for those homeowners who are already behind in their mortgage payments the wolf is at the door already. 
Losing your house is a traumatic event for families and it is a destabilizing event for our society. I think we have an obligation to extend a helping hand to responsible homeowners to help them get over the rough spots. And today I would like to hear ideas as to how we can best make the mortgage modification program work. On this point, I note that yesterday Bank of America announced that it was instituting a principal forgiveness solution for homeowners who are severely underwater. Bank of America should be congratulated for leading the way with this innovative proposal. We will be looking for ways to expand this approach and to include other banks. Again, I want to thank our witnesses for appearing today, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. And I will now yield to the ranking member from California, Congressman Darrell Issa, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This hearing is critical and timely. As you said, Mr. Chairman, and I join you, Bank of America making a decision to reduce the principal down to the value of the current value of the home is both in the homeowner's self-interest and their self-interest. As it was stated in the example uh, this morning, $250,000 home reduced to its current value of perhaps $200,000 and the mortgage reduced to that allows the homeowner at over five years to permanently shed that no longer value, but ultimately to remain in a home that would otherwise be sold to someone else for $200,000 or less. This is, this is a win-win if the homeowner can, in fact, make the ongoing payments at a reasonable uh, rate that is available in the market. It also allows people who were gimmicked or taken advantage of during the earlier time that find themselves in resetting loans teaser loans, all the other examples we've heard, if they fit in this 49,000 uh, person uh, initial uh, pilot program, as Bank of America is call calling it, they will be converted to a conventional loan, one that has a long-term ability for the homeowner to plan and to pay. <clears throat> Additionally, I might note that this plan from Bank of America <clears throat> although not without pressure from other places, came without the assistance of the program we are speaking of today. It came perhaps out of frustration for the failures uh, covered by the SIGTARP in his independent audits of HAMP. Today, <clears throat> as we look at HAMP, we look at a promise of the President, a commitment by the President, a, a commitment broadly by the Congress in both parties that is not being kept. Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent that the, uh, uh, the poster, which was actually put up by the, uh, the special IG, be up for the entire hearing because it is, first of all, factual, and second of all, I'm sure that all members will be referring to it. Without objection. <clears throat> the projection of providing relief, not application, not promise, not hope, but relief for three to four million homeowners has neared a 96 percent failure. In one year's time, as the Chairman said, approximately 170,000 homeowners have qualified for permanent loan modifications. Many of those have already redefaulted. But that is not the story that is most concerning to those of us at the dais and particularly to this member. What is concerning is the 1.3 million people who have applied and held out hope that they were going to get a modification. 1.1 remain today. Doing my arithmetic, 170,000 were put into permanent modification, 30,000 were basically told that they probably were never good candidates and after months of waiting find themselves without a loan and without hope. But beyond that, people have waited three, five, six, not now as long as nine months with an open end to get an answer. That has simply caused the, the volume to swell of people who are making uh, payments in hopes that it will lead to a solution when, in fact, it appears as though a great many of them should be looking for more affordable alternate housing, should be planning for that, and should be uh, given the opportunity to, uh, to make those plans with certainty. Mr. Chairman, both you and I have had home loans over the years, and we would be outraged 
if our application with our income and other information were not accepted within days of our contacting a loan officer. More importantly, we would be outraged if, if we were not answered within days or weeks as to whether or not, at least preliminarily, we qualify. Most of us have had pre-qualifications from banks and other lending institutions. Banks and lending institutions without government assistance or interference normally can do this in a short period of time. Clearly, this program has done just the opposite. It's created huge periods of uncertainty, perhaps well intended. We need to make a change. Uh, if I could uh, roll this video very quickly of the President so we're all reminded of the promise and what the charge is for all of us under uh, the HAMP program. Under this plan, lenders who participate will be required to reduce those payments to no more than 31 percent of a borrower's income. And this will enable as many as three to four million homeowners to modify the terms of their mortgages to avoid the, uh, foreclosure. To prevent foreclosures for as many as four million homeowners and lower interest rates and lift home values for millions more, we are implementing a plan to allow lenders to work with borrowers to refinance or restructure their mortgages. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the opinion of, of this ranking member that this is a mandate of our president. It is a program that, whether you voted for the TARP or not, must be made to work and must be made to work dramatically better than it currently is. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity of an opening statement. Yield back. I'd like to thank the gentleman, ranking member, for his statement. Uh, I would like to yield three minutes to the gentleman from Baltimore, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm very glad that you uh, called this hearing. And I'm looking forward to, to hearing from today's witnesses, and not only because it is an issue, the issue of foreclosure is an issue that affects every one of our districts, but also because we have an impressive group of witnesses before us, each of whom could occupy a hearing unto themselves. I particularly want to thank John Taylor, President and CEO of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, NCRC, it's not only bringing dedicated and passionate people together to ensure that public policy functions for the public, but also boasts an extremely talented group of uh, policy professionals who provide this Congress with invaluable assistance. I was privileged to briefly address NCRC's annual conference earlier this month, and as always, I came away inspired by their dedication to a cause greater than themselves. President Obama arrived at the White House last January facing an economic climate unlike that inherited by almost any other president before him. As a response, his administration has aggressively worked to not only stabilize the financial markets, but also to ensure that recovery is not limited to Wall Street and reaches all of our communities. The Home Affordable Modification Program was designed to make mortgage payments reasonable for homeowners who were caught in the economic downturn. However, a confluence of factors has re rendered the program far less effective than we or President Obama uh, would have imagined or hoped. Unemployment, a punctured home price bubble, and a restricted access to credit only exacerbated certain flaws in the HAMP process. Today's hearing will reveal hard truths about the design and the execution of HAMP. For that reason, this hearing is critical, Mr. Chairman, and is a critical component in our role of ensuring that government operations function with the highest level of effectiveness and efficiency. We must set aside our preconceived notions about these policies, good or bad, and conduct an honest evaluation of whether this program is accomplishing as much uh, is absolutely, as is absolutely required to get our constituents through this difficult storm. I have often said, Mr. Chairman, that we are the greatest country in the world. This is the greatest country in the world. And we will get through this storm. The question is not whether we will get through the storm. The question is who will be living in your house after the storm is over? Who will have your job after the storm is over? Will you still have your health care and your health? And will your children be able to go to college, will have gone to college after the storm is over? That is the question. And so I thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. And with that, I yield back. I now yield three minutes to the thank you, gentleman, for a statement. I now yield three minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Who's Chairman. Who's the ranking member of the subcommittee? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding today's hearing. As you know, the Domestic Policy Subcommittee 
has held three hearings on the foreclosure problem, and I appreciate the full committee's attention to this important issue. Despite the commitment of $75 billion of taxpayer money, the American people continue to suffer from the rising tide of foreclosures, which hit an all-time high last month. The ranking member and I have continued to point out the failure of the Treasury Department's technocratic tinkering to alleviate this problem and the administration's efforts to disguise the failure of their programs from the public. Despite this unprecedented commitment of taxpayer resources, a reoccurring, a reoccurring theme in this administration, the problem of foreclosure has not been solved, and in many ways it is worse than ever. The ranking member and I have pointed out Treasury's efforts to move the goalposts in an attempt to avoid accountability for its failure by redefining success. First, Treasury told us that their goal was 3 to 4 million mortgage modifications. In fact, we just heard the President say that himself. That would, quote, help keep Americans in their homes in a way that is, quote, sustainable over the long term. Then at last month's Treasury, then last month, a Treasury official told the committee that the administration's goal was actually mere offers of temporary mortgage modifications. An offer of temporary modification doesn't provide anybody sustainable help, and it is actually hurting many homeowners by giving them false hope and encouraging them to devote hard-earned resources to mortgages that will ultimately end up defaulting anyway. As I have argued before, Mr. Chairman, delaying foreclosure does not help the many Americans who are fighting to keep their jobs or find new ones. Delayed foreclosures only serve to prolong their economic hardship, drain them of much-needed resources, and defraud them of opportunities to find more affordable housing options. The Obama administration is once again failing to live up to its promises of transparency and accountability. In light of this issue, I was especially interested to read the recent audit of HAMP released by the Independent Special Inspector General for TARP, which confirmed many of our previous findings about the Treasury Department's actions. If the Bush administration and the Democratic Congress did anything right in the bailouts of 2008, it was establishing the office of the SIGTARP and putting Mr. Borofsky in place as an independent watchdog over these programs. I applaud his efforts and his staff's efforts for once again courageously exposing the waste of taxpayer resources and the lack of transparency in the Treasury Department. As the SIGTARP explains in his audit, the foreclosure problem facing the country today is reflective of the larger economic and employment problems facing the American people. Without a job, it is almost impossible for any American to afford any mortgage payment. The American people deserve jobs and an economic recovery, which this administration continues to deny them through anti-growth, big government, intervention, interventionist economic policies. The only viable long-term solution is to keep more Americans in their homes and in their jobs, for that matter, is a broad-based economic recovery built on the foundation of free markets, fiscal responsibility, and limited government that has made our nation strong and prosperous for more than 200 years. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing, and I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses. I yield to the gentleman yep. from uh, Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. As we previously uh, discussed, I have a letter here respectfully requesting that this committee do as it has done in the past and thoroughly investigate a form of voter intimidation, the attacks and threats against members of Congress that have been occurring since the vote on the health care debate. Right. Well, uh, first of all, let me thank the gentleman for his, um, uh, his interest in that. And, of course, I must say that I have an interest in it, too, because I think that threats coming from any place is something that um, we need to uh, make certain that we do everything we can to prevent it. And this committee actually is the committee that really would have the jurisdiction over that. So um, um, I'm not sure in terms of uh, how we would frame it, but I'm interested in it. And I will ask staff to look into it and see in terms of you know, what we would do, because it is such a broad area. That, um, but uh, here again, I want you to know that I am interested in it, and uh, we will talk further as to how we might be able to pursue it. Thank you for your interest. Thank you again for your bipartisan support, yeah. Mr. Chairman. We will now turn to our first panel of witnesses. It is a longstanding policy that all witnesses are sworn in. So if you please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Let me just say before we get started, and before I introduce our, our witnesses, let me just um, this is a very serious situation. People are losing their life's earnings in their homes. They have paid on it. They have put their money in. And now all of a sudden they are being asked to leave because 
of the fact that they are having difficulty making payments. You know, we have here an example of the problems that people are encountering. Where are those box of keys? Who, where are they? I just want to show them, you know, in terms of to let you know how serious this matter is and how many lives are being affected by it. You know, I have this whole big thing of keys here that I just wanted to show you, but we'll, 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 we'll move back and, 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 and do that a little later. Uh, it's coming in now? Yeah. These are keys of people in many instances that live in their house. Now the house is being foreclosed and these keys have been collected. This is a disgrace. I mean, we are a better country than this. We can do better than this. So we are having this hearing today to see what we can do to turn this around. This is just too much to take. The families are being destroyed. Children are have being moved from place to place because of the fact the mortgage is not being paid. And a lot of them, if they could get modifications, they would be able to work it out. And they just need a little support, I need a little help, or we would be where the gentleman from Maryland indicated you know, um, they'll be out of the houses, somebody else will be in them, but the houses, you know, will be filled. And, and that's the sad part. And people who've given so much of their lives, you know, and then now being asked, are being thrown out. Thank you very much. I just wanted to show that. The Honorable Neil Borowski is here today, is a Special Inspector General for the Trouble Asset Relief Program. As the principal overseer of the TARP, Mr. Borowski is responsible for conducting audits and investigations related to the hundreds of billions of dollars flowing through Treasury to rescue our troubled economy. Included in those dollars is the funding of HAMP. Today, Mr. Borowski will present findings and recommendations based on his audit of HAMP. We welcome you, Mr. Borowski. The Honorable Jean Dodaro is the Acting Controller General of the United States and the Head of the Government Accountability Office, GAO, is conducting an ongoing review of HAMP. Today, Mr. Dodaro will present an update on the activities of HAMP to, to date, as well as the preliminary findings of GAO's current evaluation of loan services, implementation of that program. Welcome, Mr. Dodaro. We have also with us uh, Mr. John Taylor. Mr. Taylor is the President and CEO of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. Today, Mr. Taylor will present the findings of NCRC's investigation of foreclosure rescue scams, as well as the result of a survey of distressed borrowers seeking assistance from HAMP. Welcome, Mr. Taylor, for being here. And of course, we also have with us Mr. Calabria, is the Director of Financial Regulation Studies at the Cato Institute. We are delighted to have all of you here. So why don't we start with you, Mr. Borowski, and then we will just come right down the line. Thank you, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, members of the committee. It's a privilege to appear once again before you to testify and to present our most recent audit on the HAMP program. I'd like to, to thank this committee for its support of our office and the leadership and tenacity that you have shown in bringing transparency and accountability to the HAMP program. The program was announced more than a year ago, and as Treasury has acknowledged, the results have been disappointing, with fewer than 200,000 mortgages being permanently modified. In order to the, assess the success of a program, however, one must start with any government program with what it set out to do, what were its goals, what was it meant to, who was it meant to help. Unfortunately, with respect to the HAMP program, even this preliminary step has been a challenge. When the program was first announced, Treasury described it as a program designed to help three to four million homeowners by modifying their mortgages to a sustainable level so they could stay in their homes. If this was the goal, absent some unexpected or unanticipated change in circumstances, it will not be met. As a Treasury official acknowledged to us, it's estimated that half of that amount will occur one and a half to two million permanent modifications. Now, Treasury has consistently told us throughout this audit, and it's borne out by 
uh, statements the Treasury made back last year in March that its goal wasn't for permanent modifications, three to four million. It was to make three to four million offers for temporary or trial modifications, and it may well be that the program is on pace to meet that goal. However, as we detail in our audit report, we believe that this goal is essentially meaningless. This program's success will be defined and must be defined as it was justified to the American people. How many people who will receive permanent modifications and get to stay in their homes as a result of this program? And it is unclear at this point what that number may be. One thing that is certain, it will be extremely difficult or impossible until Treasury puts out its number of what its estimate is and what its goal is for permanent modifications for it to be able to honestly and accurately assess the success of the program and, far more importantly for today's purposes, to make the necessary changes so they can meet those goals. We believe that it is unacceptable that one year into this program, Treasury has still failed to identify what its goal is for the number of permanent modifications to actually help people stay in their homes. There have been some successes. Treasury has signed up more than 110 servicers, getting 90 percent coverage, and has built an infrastructure for this program. But as we detail in this audit, the disappointing numbers are the result of some mistakes. It's been plagued by certain errors. Servicers have complained to us about the, the constant changes in, in program guidance from Treasury, um, documentation requirements, even to the, the net present value test, which is the computer model that, tre that Treasury prepared that was intended so that the servicers um, can know whether or not a mortgage is, um, is, is, uh, is appropriate for it to be modified or not. These types of changes have, have, have contributed to problems with the program. Similarly, we have noted um, problems with the result of Treasury pushing and at times pressuring servicers to do verbal trial modifications. That is putting mortgages temporarily into the program based only on the word, the verbal statements of a borrower without getting verified income, verified documentation of income. Um, this problem has led to, um, it's been, we found it to be essentially counterproductive. It's led to a huge backlog of trial modifications. Importantly, just diverted scarce resources that could otherwise be devoted to permanently converting modifications. And, and perhaps worst of all, it may have actually harmed the people this program was intended to help borrowers who were put into hopeless modifications with no chance to succeed. We have also learned about dangers about redefault, and that is when borrowers who get permanent modifications but are unable to continue because either the, per the payments that they have are still unaffordable or because they are too hopelessly underwater to be able to continue or decide not to continue to make payments. We have recommended to Treasury to reassess the vulnerability to redefault, lest billions of taxpayer dollars be lost. Um, supporting mortgage modifications that will be doomed to failure. Regrettably, Treasury has not adopted this recommendation. On a final note, Mr. Chairman, I just to address your point about mortgage modification fraud, uh, it is a, a significant and widespread problem. SIGTARP alone, we have two dozen invest criminal investigations ongoing into, the, into these frauds. And I, I am pleased to announce that we have had a recent success. Uh, last summer, we worked with the FTC to shut down one of these frauds. Um, and this week, I am very pleased to announce that two of the principals of that fraud, uh, Glenn Rosofsky and Michael Trapp, um, SIGTARP agents working with our partners at IRS, secured criminal charges that were filed against them in California um, that will hold them accountable for the more than $1 million fraud that they executed. Um, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Ice, and members of the committee, thank you for hearing my testimony today. And I do look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Borowski. Mr. Dodero. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Issa, members of the committee. I am very pleased to be here today to discuss GAO's work regarding the Home Affordable Modification Program. Uh, as been pointed out this morning, we issued a report uh, last uh, July looking at the program. Right now, there has been a lot more trial modifications uh, put in place than permit modifications that have been pointed out so far. 1.1 trial modification million uh, uh, trial modifications were put in place. 800,000 of those are still active, and less than 200,000 uh, have been achieved uh, permanent modification. But it's also important to look at the trends. If I might direct your attention to our chart uh, over here, the top line is the trial modifications that have been started, and as you can see. Uh, they peaked around last September-October timeframe and since then have been declining. 
the line, the dotted line at the bottom, are the beginnings of the permanent modifications that have were started and then converted into the 170,000 that were in place at the end of February. Now, the challenge going forward uh, is to take the pipeline of the trial modifications and, and have decisions made on them, whether they are to be converted to permanent modifications or, uh, or not. Uh, but also, importantly, uh, the pipeline for trial modifications has to be replenished for these uh, first uh, lien uh, holder uh, uh, mortgages in order to make sure uh, that the goals of the program ultimately are achieved. In addition to the first lien program, Treasury needs to uh, establish and move forward on the second lien holder program. There is a foreclosure uh, alternative program that is waiting in the wings to be started as well. And there is the hardest hit housing fund, which is directed in, in five states in particular. So you have other programs that have not yet uh, been implemented that are necessary to be able to do this, as well as dealing with this first lien holder modification program. Now, like a lot of other aspects of the Troubled Asset Relief Program, uh, the GAO, uh, along with the IG from SIGTARP, have been making a number of recommendations to increase the transparency and accountability of the program. Treasury has taken some steps to address our recommendations last July but has yet to fully implement many of them. First, uh, we had recommended that they establish performance metrics and, and benchmarks, which would include uh, the numbers uh, target for permanent modifications as well. They also had not yet resolved uh, compliance issues associated with remedial actions or penalties for servicers that were not uh, complying with the program. We also suggested they regularly update the number of people who could be helped through this program because of evolving economic uh, and other uh, circumstances. Uh, we have continued our work and we have noted uh, preliminarily some indications of inconsistencies about how these borrowers are being treated, when borrowers are communicated with, how early in the process of the, uh, the lateness on their payments. Some are being contacted after 30 days being delinquent, others not until 60 days. So there's inconsistencies in terms of the criteria that are put forth. There's also uh, problems with how complaints uh, are being dealt with. Uh, there's no uh, set process uh, for that yet in place. Also, we had recommended that Treasury follow up to determine whether or not the counseling requirements that were required for certain borrowers were, were uh, complied with. And they have not yet done that. I think we are missing a huge opportunity here for more consumer education and financial literacy and consumer protections. Uh, but we won't know whether that is complied with or not going forward unless Treasury implements our recommendation. Uh, we are also looking at what kind of appeal process would make sense for this program to provide due process protections uh, for borrowers. Uh, I just want to assure this committee that we take this issue very seriously. The TARP program has helped a number of institutions and needs to have similar help offered to households uh, to afford them the protections going forward. We will continue. Uh, our work looking at whether or not this program is achieving its objectives, whether or not it is being managed effectively uh, and carried out properly and prudently in the best interest of the American citizens. So I thank you for your time this morning. I would be happy to answer questions at the appropriate time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Dr. Calabria. Uh, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, uh, distinguished members of the committee, I do want to thank you for the invitation to appear at today's uh, important hearing. Before I begin my testimony, I do want to emphasize a point the Chairman made about foreclosure scams, and uh, these are widespread, and I think we want to should all commend the work that SIGTARP is doing. Uh, I would as well encourage the committee to bring the Federal Trade Commission up to update you on their efforts, and they really are the ones leading the effort against foreclosure scams. Uh, my testimony is going to touch on essentially two points. Uh, the first point in question, rather, is why have the current administration and the previous administration efforts, along with those of the mortgage industry, to reduce foreclosures had so little impact on the foreclosure numbers? I very much want to emphasize at this point it is not a partisan issue. If you look at HOPE now and you look at HAMP, they are very different programs, but the assumptions underlying their structure are the same. Uh, the second question is 
given what we know, why those efforts haven't worked, what are our options going forward to improve those? So starting with, I will give a very short answer to why I think the previous efforts have not worked, and that's because the implicit assumption behind these programs that most of, if not all, of the foreclosures are a result of predatory lending or exploding arms is simply false. The simple truth is that the vast majority of mortgage defaults are being driven by the same factors that have always driven mortgage defaults, generally a negative equity position on the part of the homeowner coupled with a life event, generally most often a job loss uh, or reduction of earnings in some other point. So I would emphasize until both of these components, negative equity, negative income shock are addressed, I think foreclosures will remain at very high levels. Uh, I would note if payment shock alone were the dominant driver of defaults, then we would observe most defaults occurring around the time of reset on the interest rate, but we do not see that. What we see is the vast majority of defaults occurring long before reset. Uh, Obviously, the high level of foreclosures, I think, has left us all frustrated. Uh, I think we need to start with asking ourselves that these answers need to be grounded in solid, unbiased analysis. And I would want to reiterate and, and emphasize some of the points that Neil made, which is to gauge the success of this program, we need to have a reasonable baseline. I don't believe we have any really baseline to establish whether the Treasury is doing a good or bad job, really. Uh, and I think if you look at the promises that the Treasury has made, it's really kind of hard to conclude that they're either just making the numbers up or they don't have a sense of what their own metrics are. So the important part of this is Treasury needs to put out metrics upon which we can measure their performance and know whether they're doing, they're doing a good or bad job. Uh, I think it's also essential that Treasury put out a credible, clear analysis of the cost and benefits of this program. Uh, if the full $75 billion is spent, and if we end up, which I expect that maybe we will have, if we're on the track to have maybe permanent modifications of about 200000 if we're lucky, then that assistance will mean that we will have spent almost $400,000 per permanent modification, which is, I will note, more than twice the median U.S. home value. So we do need to make sure that this money is going and being spent effectively. Uh, before discussing specific proposals, I think we need to start from the very clear, uh, very clear reality that almost half, about 50 percent of foreclosures foreclosures today are driven by job loss. Absolutely no way we can address the foreclosure situation without addressing the job situation. So I would say the most significant thing we could do is try to find a way to foster an environment that is conducive to private sector job creation and the foreclosure problem will follow that. Um, in addition, I think we need to focus not simply on homeowners in foreclosure, but those who are potentially at risk of foreclosure. For instance, I will note that about 4 million of the jobs that have been lost in this recession have been in what are called mass layoffs. Uh, mass layoffs present a double shock to our household. Not only do you have the loss of your home, but you also take a loss to the housing market because of a very uh, big shock to the labor market. But as damaging as mass layoffs can be, they have one advantage, which is the Department of Labor collects statistics on them and reports them because there are laws that require that em employees receive notice. But so there's a point in intervention where we can try to help families before they actually hit foreclosure because we know that these mass layoffs are coming. But despite that connection, there's almost no coordination between HUD and Department of Labor. So I would encourage HUD and I would encourage Department of Labor to partner so that the appropriated dollars we have spent so far in counseling funds can be focused on those workers at the time they receive a notice of a layoff. Because we know they're going to put there's a high probability that six, nine months later after their layoff is when they're going to be getting the financial trouble. Uh, I would also emphasize, you know, we do need to approach this as a form of triage, which in my mind, we need to put our resources at those families who need it the most. Uh, several of the programs, such as those that are aimed not at families in foreclosure, but simply those who cannot refinance because they're underwater, I think should be ended. These divert resources away from the families who are most in need and focused on families who don't need it. Uh, so in concluding, I want to focus, emphasize very, very strongly we need to do something about the underlying causes, and the underlying causes are not arms. They are, they are in the employment market. They are negative equity, and that needs to be the focus of this. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Calabria. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Uh, good morning, Chairman Towns, Ranking Mer Member Izzer, and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, my name is John Taylor. I'm President of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. I come to you from the front lines of America's foreclosure crisis to tell you that the battle is being lost. Our economy will continue to be dragged down by these mounting foreclosures if immediate change is not instituted. The Federal Government's response to the foreclosure crisis called Making Home Affordable comes in two forms. HAMP, the uh, Home Affordable Modification Program, 
and HARP, the Home Affordable Refinance Program. The Federal Government's response, HAMP and HARP, while an improvement over the previous administration, is simply failing to make a difference. The goal of HAMP and HARP was to help nearly 5 million families facing foreclosure. How many have they helped to date? HAMP has modified a total of 170,000 permanent loans. HARP has refinanced a total of 190,000 permanent loans. So a total of all the 5 million plus uh, uh, folks facing foreclosure, the government in the total length of this program has done 360,000 uh, permanent uh, modifications and refinances. Now consider that just last month we had over 300,000 foreclosure filings alone. In 2009, for the year, we had 2.8 million foreclosure filings uh, alone for that year. So when you consider a number like 360,000 being modified or refinanced, you can understand why we're saying it's a failure. Two important points here, too. According to Inspector General, uh, Special Inspector General Borofsky, the Treasury Department under its current plans will expend only $22 billion of the $75 billion committed to the HAMP program. Why they're sitting on this funds is beyond belief. As for HARP, 99 percent of the refinancing of this program does it to borrowers with LTVs of less than 105 percent, meaning they're really not helping people who are below water, they're helping people who are floating on the water. Now, the keys to the crisis that Chairman Towns pointed to, I just want to point out to the members of the committee, these keys represent a home, an individual home. Every single key in this box represents a family that's losing their home, these keys are just what will happen while we have this hearing. These keys represent 1,635 families across America who will lose their homes just while we sit here talking about what needs to be done. And let me show you what Fannie and Freddie, sorry, what the federal government is going to do through the HAMP program during the same period of time. These are the amount of homes, these are the amount of homes they're going to help out of this lot. That's, that's the entire HAMP. During this program, all these houses, during this hearing, all these houses are going to be lost. This is what the HAMP program is going to help. Well, let's give the government some more credit. What are they going to do with the HOT? Those are the refinancing. Your friends at Fannie and Freddie. Here's what they're going to do in that same period of time for the same, that same group of people. Now, if you think that this is success, then, you know, continue the way things are. But I can tell you this, regardless of how you, how you view this, we spend trillions for Wall Street. This is a trickle for Main Street. And whether you, you think, whether you look at this crisis and say, well, you know, and I know some members of Congress are fond of saying, you know, some of the homeowners bit off more than they can chew. And others will say, well, you know, there are a lot of greedy people, uh, lenders, brokers looking for a fee, a quick fee. Let's be clear about two things. First, the subprime lending became the norm for the mortgage industry, uh, and, and that's the kind of loan that was made to, to anybody who, uh, the, 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 the subprime lending became the norm for the mortgage industry. Banks would, banks would not have made these loans seven or eight years ago. They simply would not be the norm. Subprime was not the norm. It was, an, it was an exception to what this industry did. This became the norm. Then this Congress in 1994 told the Federal Reserve to fix this, said you issue unfair and deceptive rules and practices that prohibit the kind of activities that are going to land people in this, including people who are biting off more they, than they can chew. In the old days, the bank would have said you can't afford this. But because you can get a fee, you can get money, quick money, because it's being guaranteed by Wall Street or by your securitizer. That this is what happened. This industry ran amok, and the Federal Reserve did not respond to this crisis until July of 2008, when it finally, long after the horse had escaped, the bond, the bond, the hay had rotted, the bond roof fell in. Long after that, they finally issued rules on unfair and deceptive practices that would have prevented this kind of system. Second. For those who think, well, you know, buyer beware, I got mine, good luck to those folks. Let me just say this. Everybody has a dog in this hunt when it comes to these foreclosures. Every foreclosure reduces the value of their neighbor's property. Millions of foreclosures cause job loss, reduction in tax, tax revenue, and dragging down the American economy. Foreclosures reduce all homeowners' equity, and for many, a significant portion of their retirement savings. Over $7 trillion of wealth has been lost by American households. 
So let me, I, I, I'm out of time, Mr. Chair, so I can, if I can stop now. I can talk a little about the studies. I wanted to make a couple of recommendations. It's obviously the committee's call. Well, you have an opportunity to do so in the question and answer period, I'm certain. Okay. okay. Thank yes. you very much for your yes. testimony. Uh, let me begin, I guess, um, Mr. Borowski and Mr. Dodaro. What do you really see here as the problem? You know, uh, the fact that we've only been able to do less than 200,000 modifications. I mean, what is the problem? And there's $75 billion, I think, has been allocated. 50 and then 25, yeah, I think it was 75, yeah. So what is the problem? I mean, people are losing, the, and when I look at the keys and know, in fact, that they represent people. They represent folks who poured their hearts into their homes, saved, and then all of a sudden now they are asked to leave because they miss payments on their home. They're good people, people that want to do right. What do you think that needs to be done that's not being done? Mr. Chairman, what we found in our audit is that I think a, lot, a part of it is that doing a program like this, is, it's very retail oriented. It's on an individual basis. And when Treasury set this up, they, they outsourced that to the, the mortgage servicers. One of the problems that we've heard, and I know that uh, in reviewing Mr. Dara's testimony that they've seen as well, is this lack of, of planning up front. Uh, almost a, a ready, fire, aim type of approach where these constant changes in guidance and documentation and requirements, and, and yesterday another guidance change came down. And it's an admirable change. It's, it's good for the program, but it's going to require these servicers to once again reset their systems, reset their, their procedures. And if there had been, perhaps if there had been more planning up front, these servicers wouldn't have been constantly having to react to these changes in circumstances and the emphasis on verbal modifications. So what happened is the infrastructure was not quite in place and then it got overwhelmed by constant changes and, and lack of adequate planning up front that has created this, this, these tremendous backlogs and inefficiencies. We've all heard reports about servicers who lose uh, borrowers' um, paperwork. They send the paperwork in and then the paperwork is gone and we, we read about how you know, you could see seven or eight times borrowers send in the paperwork. And one of the servicers explained to us that they did, in fact, lose paperwork because they were so overwhelmed because of the verbal modifications, because of the constant changes of their systems, that they hired a vendor and the vendor lost all the documents. That's not in any way to remove responsibility from the servicers. That just wasn't the focus of our report. But I think one of the contributions to why this has been so slow to get off the ground and why it's been so inefficient is this sort of lack of planning. I would uh, add a couple points. First, I would underscore the fact that there's been a number of program changes. So the program hasn't been stable. Uh, for example, last summer, Treasury initially uh, mentioned that the, it would be okay to approve trial modifications based upon stated income as opposed to having documentation and verification of the income of the borrowers. Then subsequently, they changed that guidance and now uh, before trial modifications, you need to have, you know, substantiated documentation. The other uh, point and the recommendation we made last July uh, was that you needed program metrics. There's no standard guidance about when the servicers have to contact the borrowers, whether it's 30 days after they're delinquent or 60 days. You need some standards. How quickly should they respond to telephone calls? How quickly should they process the information? All these uh, issues in terms of how the process should proceed. How do they handle complaints? How do they do it? None of these things are yet standardized that where you could hold the servicers accountable. And as I mentioned, we made a recommendation last July that they have some ability to invoke penalties for servicers that don't comply with the requirements, but they need to be established first. Uh, secondly, uh, they're having difficulty in a number of cases from the servicers we talk with of getting income verification from the borrowers, and that's taking uh, some additional time. Now they've, uh, you know, forestalled making decisions on some of the trial modifications. Uh, the other issue is that these other programs, which are intended to deal with some of the negative uh, equity issues, like the hardest hit pro uh, fund, hasn't been started yet. The second lien holder program hasn't been started yet. So. 
There were some problems with stability in the first program out of the chute for the first lien ho homeowner one, and these other programs haven't been brought online yet, even though it's been a year uh, into the program. So with those activities, you, we think you'll see a better outcome, uh, but they need to be managed properly. Quickly. So you don't think it's a lack of money? I, I think there's plenty of money. I mean, of the $36.7 uh, that they've committed to the HAMP program, $58 million has been spent as of the end of February. So there's plenty of money. It's, it's, it's not a question of lack of, of funding. It's a question of making sure you have the commitment of the servicers. Uh, the Treasury has enough people to ac accurately manage the program and that there's process and, and means to hold people accountable for moving forward, and they're not there yet. Right. Time has expired. I yield five minutes to the gentleman from California, Ranking Member Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to begin, I'm going to share just one example of the many I've received. <clears throat> this one comes from a Mr. Paul Habib, who was involved in a trial loan modification. He has submitted and received approval, first verbally and then canceled based on a rule change, then in writing and canceled based on some rule and change. He's now being asked, have, after they have lost his applications twice, to fill out yet a third one. Now, he happens to be a Wamu Chase uh, applicant, but certainly we're going to hear more today about the problems of Countrywide, since it's a defunct company that uh, B of A is trying to uh, act on behalf of after their acquisition. Let me try to be a businessman for a moment, uh, 10 years removed, but, but I still, let's get to the core of what he and uh, uh, Mr. Dodaro, what, what you've seen that doesn't work, I've read your reports, they're very good, but they tell us that this system that we're presently using is not going to work any better in spite of that curve under the current situation. 1.3 million people were given hope, 170,000 were given loans. Uh, the delta between the hope and the loan is so great as to be a misery inflicted by the government in their own program. I think we can all agree that, that that's not acceptable. So let me just run through, and, and others uh, uh, that have familiarity with this can weigh in. As I said in my opening statement, if, if I went out to buy a home today, I would go for pre-approval. It would take a matter of days or weeks. I would then have an amount of money based on documentation that I would qualify for. I would look at a home that I wanted to buy. Let's just assume it's my own home and it's in foreclosure. And I would have it appraised independently and they would come up with an appraisal within days. None of that has changed from the boom era to today. Why in the world are we not discussing a change that says, look, anyone can pre-approve you for a loan. Anyone can, uh, qualified can do the assessment of the value and at that point, the pre-approval process is over and the application is submitted with knowledge of what you can afford and knowledge of what the home is worth. And this system worked for years relatively well <coughs> with, uh, with a matter of days between the applicant's desire and those two being met. Can you comment on why we're not talking about the change to that system today? And Mr. Darrell, I'll start with you because you talked about refilling the backlog. I would propose that the worst thing in the world is to have more people into a system that takes six, nine months or more to get through while they have this period of uncertainty. Well, f first of all, the, the mortgage alternative program that Treasury has announced but yet not yet implemented is the, meant to deal with more upfront decisions about whether or not there is even a prospect that a trial modification makes sense, and if not, you know, move to a short sell uh, type arrangement or other vehicle to help uh, create a smooth exit strategy. Yeah, but we're only talking about this program because if we right. continue doing what we've been doing that has failed, then only insanity if explains why we would continue doing what we know won't work. Well, I, I think in terms of making sure that the program has a fair opportunity, it needed to be set up to have some stability to be managed properly. And I, I still think that if Treasury proceeds, uh, but there will have to be better decisions made. Uh, the one key decision that <laughs> no, I I'm going to cut yeah, you off. I'm going to yeah. cut you off because that's exactly B 
business as usual around here. And I, I, I've gotten better from you many times. But in this case, Mr. Borofsky, I want to move to you because your, uh, your report told us we've, we've had enough time to see a trend. And people have suffered for a year under a program that isn't working and is unlikely to work dramatically better. Would you give us your comments on those changes or others that you want us to feature? Well, we're talking here about some of the structural problems with the servicers. I think that we're, we're, it's getting better. I mean, that's the good news. This, this whole idea of verbal modifications, and ver which I think is such a source of so many of the problems that right. you described. Right. We put in was, too much in the front end without hope of coming out the back end. In order end. to get these numbers up, to, to flood the, the system and, over, and the overcapacity, thankfully, that's going to be done. Uh, those have been, the Treasury has changed on that one. Um, and that, I think, will, in, will be very helpful to increase the conversion rate. Um, I think other of these structural issues, I think Treasury has got to decide and sort of do a final issue of guidance to foresee the various problems. And we're going to ask them that question in just yeah. a few minutes. So, so I think that there's good news that these structural things can be, be adjusted. I think the, the metrics, which are so important, as, as Mr. Dodaro recommended in July and we've reemphasized today, so you can have accountability and make changes to those benchmarks and those goals are important. But the third potential problem is redefault. Um, and that Treasury has not shown a willingness to reconsider or to reexamine. Yeah. Because ultimately, yeah. this, this yeah. program will yeah. not yeah. be successful. Thank if you. We're going to get to that. Out. The other two just wanted to chime in quickly, I believe, if the Chairman will yeah. indulge. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Is. I think your question is right on point. And I think, though, the answer is very much in your opening remarks when you mentioned that the Bank of America is about to do 45,000 principal write downs. Now, they were encouraged by state AGs. I will use the word encouraged loosely. But the point is, that is what is really going to make the difference at the end of the day, the principal write downs. And, you know, in defense of Treasury, I will say that on paper the, the plan looks good, but the problem is it is voluntary. And unless and until we have something like uh, what we proposed to Secretary Guyton and Secretary Paulson, uh, to Secretary Paulson in, in February of 08, you must have mandatory compliance in this program. You are not going to get the principal okay. right And tests. Dr. Capri Capri yeah. you so that will make, make the huge difference. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I now yield um, five minutes to uh, the gentleman from Maryland, Congressman Cummings. Thank you very much. Um, gentlemen, I am very familiar with all of what you were saying, because in my district we have uh, two people in my office that all they do is foreclosure prevention. That is all they do. And it is a big problem. And Mr. Borofsky, uh, what, if anything, prevents a lender from deciding midway through the HAMP process that the $1,000 or so whatever it might be incentive payment is not worth the company's resources and just say to heck with it? And, and the reason why I am I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do we get to this effectiveness and efficiency? Because it seems like we have a program here which we want to work we think should work, but when we scratch the surface, it's nothing, it's not, it's not working. So we've got the money, but we're not spending the money. And Mr. Cabrera, Calabria said it would cost us, it's costing us $400,000 a piece. That's not accurate because that means that if we were, that means that we spent all the money, but we aren't spending. Uh, we spend just a pittance of the money. So, do we need a, a, some kind of different carrot? Do we di need some type of stick? I think that you know, to answer your question about the the, the midstream change of heart, um, I think it gets to a central point. Under the rules, um, a servicer once they sign the contract and they 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 run the net present value test and it's positive, they do have an obligation to go forward and modify the mortgage, um, <laughs> but. But your question almost goes to one of compliance. How do we make sure that they follow those rules? Um, right now, Freddie Mac has been signed up to be the compliance agent. Uh, our office is about to, in, to do an audit, uh, about to announce an audit into compliance. I know the GAO is doing some work on compliance as well. Um, but that will be one of, one of the methods, which is a vigorous and, and I think it is very important to have a compliance um, regimen in place. And one of the problems the GAO has pointed out, and I, I don't want to speak for them, is that it has taken a while just to to get that compliance shop up and running, uh, and we are going to see how effective it has been. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dodaro, um, other than your office and Mr. Barofsky's office, where is there, is there any other oversight of HAMP? And, and as we know, Freddie Mac is the 
compliance agent for HAMP? Has Freddie Mac met its responsibilities in, in that role? And what about within Treasury? Have sufficient resources been allocated to effectively administer and monitor the program? Uh, one of the recommendations we made uh, back uh, in July last year was that Treasury look at and make a determination whether it has the ac accurate enough resources uh, on board to uh, implement the program. We still think they need to be able to do that. In fact, they have uh, you know, went from uh, reduced the number of people that they have had on place from 36 to 29. They only have 27 to 29 positions filled. So we still think they need to look at whether or not they have enough people in order to be able to do it. Uh, we do think there needs to be a, an overall uh, compliance program put in place that is really not there that, is, as uh, Mr. Borowski pointed out, we are going to continue to follow that up. But really, the, the oversight is really coming from our office and Mr. Borowski's office and needs to come from Treasury over the servicers. And that is why we have encouraged them to put a better system in place to ensure compliance. Now, Mr. Taylor, the, the NCRC has released the results of a survey of homeowners seeking assistance to avoid foreclosure. What were you looking for in the survey and can you share some of your findings? And I understand that African American uh, folks were less likely to, to, to be able to benefit. They were less likely to benefit from the programs and can you give us any set, us, set any light on on that for right, us? we would we were trying to uh, uh, look at the the front line of what was really transpiring for people so we went to 29 counseling agencies around the country not the entire country but the folks we could work with is your mic on uh, okay. it looks like it's on okay all right how about now okay and it's uh, a close closeness issue you must be one with the mic one with the mic okay um, can I get the time back that I might have transferred? <laughs> okay. So uh, what we discovered that even to the minimum amount that the program is working, that if you are an African American, you are 50 percent less likely to get a modification under this program, which really is abhorring. And further, we also discovered that if you are 50 or older, and many people looking at heading towards retirement, many people who are indeed classified as seniors, 50 percent of them are going to uh, also have very, very be get, have great difficulty in getting a modification, a permanent modification. So um, not only is the program really just not making the dent in the problem, it is not really being administered in a way that is fair across the board. I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for um, Maryland. I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have said many times, I said in my opening statement, this thing is a mess. Um, Mr. Borofsky indicated in his opening comments that it is tough to even have uh, to figure out what the exact goal is. You know, I learned a long time ago, you can't get anywhere if you don't know where you are going. You have got to have a defined goal you are trying to achieve. We have had changing metrics. We have had you know, the promise or the hope of Four million, potentially four million people getting their their mortgage modified, and yet 170 thousand there, and then of course the redefault problem that's already been uh, been talked about. For those who actually get permanent, 40 percent of them are likely to redefault. So, uh, a total mess. But I actually want to go to Mr. And Calabria. Am I saying it right? We've heard several Calabria. Okay, heard several fronts. You, you you said I think great. You know, it's it's tough to pay a mortgage if you don't have a job. I mean that's that's what this in large part boils down to. So we can have, we can continue to have this big government oriented approach, uh, big spending, big regulation to, to our economic concerns out there. Or frankly, in my humble opinion, we, we can get back to creating a framework and an environment that actually is conducive to economic growth, actually fosters job creation in the private sector. And, um, and I would argue uh, doesn't create policies that, that, that don't create uncertainty out there for the small business owner and, and the people who actually create jobs. So uh, my, my question is a general one to you. Um, what is Congress doing right in, in fostering a framework and a context for economic growth and job creation to take place in the private sector? Uh, what, in fact, is Congress? I, I mean, I think we've got a lot of things we're doing wrong. Um, uh, but 
general question on what we can do to, to get to the heart of this. Because again, until you have a job, it's tough to make a mortgage payment. Uh, and, and I would agree, and I, and I would emphasize, and I, and I would say as well, to touch on the last question, uh, we've certainly seen during this recession that uh, African Americans have been hit harder in terms sure of the have. labor market than anybody else. And certainly, this is part of the reason that this explains why the denial rates are different, because quite frankly, the HAMP program does not really help you if you've lost your job. And it, it does not deal with that as an issue. So I think this needs to be rethought in that regard. Uh, I would say as a broad uh, measure, private sector needs to have some certainty to be able to plan. So despite whatever one might think about any set of rules or legislation, you need to have a set of rules so that the uh, private sector can plan around them. Uh, and I think many businessmen would probably tell you that even a bad set of rules that they know that they can plan with is better than rules that change, you know, off and on. So, uh, you know, my own perspective, so w w whether whatever one thinks about uh, the recently passed health care, at least it's done. Yeah. And that's something that the private sector can move forward with and plan around. Uh, I do think we need to get our situation in terms of, you know, our fiscal situation in order. I, any small businessman today is going to is has to factor higher taxes into his future plans. Yeah. And no, no, that's no, something that I think we need a credible path going forward on. Uh, I think we also need to find ways to get banks to lend again in a serious way. And this is, I think, one of the perverse uh, implications of where monetary policy and fiscal policy have worked against us. Normally, very low record interest rates help create uh, businesses, but in this environment, banks are essentially able to borrow at nothing, put it in treasury bills for three, three and a half percent. That's an, a very large interest rate margin for a bank, risk-free. If they're doing that, they have no incentive to go out and lend to the private sector because they can really just make great risk-free returns right now. Part of that is they're trying to make these returns to cover up the losses they have on their balance sheets. Right. I think we need to be more aggressive in terms of the bank regulators and making banks actually recognize losses on their balance sheets. Uh, we've got at least probably half a trillion and probably let second million you, loans that aren't recognized. You, you think we'd be better off simply not having the program? You think the, the false hope this program gives to some homeowners, the problems we've seen, the, the, the uh, lack of transparency, the lack of a clearly defined goal, everything we've seen over the last year, uh, you think we'd be better off uh, I, I, simply I think letting the market work and, and letting, as, as, as the, the ranking member pointed out in his opening statement, letting banks work with their, uh, the, the homeowner, the servicer work with the homeowner, and, or the bank, the lending institutes work with the homeowner, and work it out amongst themselves versus the heavy hand of government coming in? Well, I, I would say as an overall short answer of that is given how few people have actually been helped relative to the universe of it, I think it's probably done more harm than good and that you have encouraged people to, for instance, a lot of what I hear is sometimes people are encouraged to, in order to get to the front of the line, stop paying your mortgage. Yeah, well, I that's going to ding your credit. Uh, so I think some of this, you're really encouraging probably more harm than good. I will lay out, you know, my bias and, and my I, I, perspective I, is that I think taking Mr. our Taylor's adjustment in the housing in here, market. But I, I did want to, well, yeah. well, yeah. well, yeah. well, yeah. I will yield the gentleman an additional minute. You're, oh, God you're throwing you, the baby out with the bathwater here. I mean, look, it's, it's, to say that it's done more harm than good is just ludicrous. It, it, simply, well, hasn't, disagree with it's, that. it simply hasn't been effective. And also, to start from the premise that, you know, well, the problem is unemployment and, and, and lack of equity, as he puts it. That's why we're having these foreclosures. It's kind of like saying, well, the house is gone. Why is the house gone? Well, it burnt down. And then stopping with that level of thinking. Why did it burn down? We have unemployment and lack of equity because of a massive foreclosure, malfeasant uh, lending practices that put people in unsustainable look, mortgages. Look, look. And, and, and to reverse that, we've got to address that, first clean it up, but also understand that well, you you, 8 question. million American families are not wrong, Congressman. Yeah. 8 million American families didn't set out to put themselves in a malfeasant loan or an unsustainable loan. Well, it certainly sounds like you're saying that. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that a program that is, is, lacks the accountability that this one does and, and extends false hope to people, the very people we're trying to help is a program that has serious uh, flaws and, and, and failures, and what we so want to correct. Let me work. ask, let me, I want to do one last question if I can in my last minute, my extra minute, thank you, Mr. Chairman, to, to the Inspector General. Um, wh wh why do you think Treasury is reluctant to, one, one of the suggestions you had in your report, and I asked this, I think, to Mr. Allison in the last hearing we had, reluctant to look at the underlying loan to determine if some of the fraudulent things were there in the, in the original loan. Why, why is Treasury reluctant to implement that suggestion you had in your last report? Um, 
as they've explained it to me, is that it's it's sort of a akin to a uh, a resource issue from their perspective. They believe that tracking the original loan. This again, this is the explanation that they provided. Um, that getting the original loan file and the original loan application would be very resource intensive. As you know, these mortgages go are sold, were sold and resold and resold and resold, uh, and therefore. Um, they claim that it would be very difficult to obtain the original mortgage file. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield to the Thank you. I now yield to Congressman Lynch from Massachusetts. So he nope, not, here. not here. I now yield from to Mrs. Norton of DC. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was uh, uh, daunted and amazed by Mr. Calabrias notion in the middle of a crisis better to have no program than to take a program where we are essentially dealing with an not only unanticipated but unprecedented crisis and everybody knows we're learning as we go along because we've never done it before uh, <laughs> so the notion of saying well so leave everybody out there as my my friend on the other if side could, to negotiate for themselves uh, you know, it, it, it has blown my mind. I have a question here about the second lien program because these are the people. Will the gentlelady yield? The gentlelady will not yield. She has only a few minutes. You had your time. Uh, the um, I, I'm particularly concerned about those at very particular re risk and a program that uh, may meet Mr. Calabria's notion of better not have it than have it because it hasn't done anything. Although I do not buy his notion that you should just leave people out there on their own uh, when even government can't figure out what to do. Um, this notion about 50 percent of the, we know that 50 percent of the homes in foreclosure had a second lien on them. So now you really have trouble here. A year ago, Treasury announced, okay, we understand it in their learning curve and they uh, instituted a new component of HAMP to help home, home, homeowners with multiple liens on their property. Now, these figures uh, need to be explained. Only three servicers have signed up. What kept that from happening? Uh, no second liens have been modified. Uh, that's a year into the program. That, that's beyond failure, uh, beyond needing fixing. It may need to be <laughs> totally rethought although I do not buy into the notion that all right, throw up your hands and don't do anything. I want to ask Mr. Borofsky, Mr. Uh, uh, Dodaro, and Mr. Taylor in particular, first to get at the root cause. Why didn't this program get off the ground in the first place as a component of HAMP? Uh, and without such a program, is there any way to help these people who have second liens and may be in the greatest need of all? Mr. Borofsky, why don't we start with you and go to the three gentlemen I asked? Sure. Um, well, I think that it is good news that in the last week they've signed up two of you know two additional. Um, what happened in the last week that they somebody got religion there? Well, we did provide a draft audit of our report uh, about two weeks ago. So, um, although I, I think that's something that's been in the works, but but your frustration, we share your frustration as as we we detail in our report. Um, you know, the original draft, it was just one, and we're, we're, it's good to see that they've signed up three of the biggest players in the market. Um, but it has been a year um, since the, the details of this, of this, the idea of modifying second loans, and it is such an important part of this program. So is the lack of people signing up that kept it from getting off the ground? Was more needed to make that happen? Uh, perhaps. I mean, we have not yet audited the second lien program. It's something that we wanted to see, let it get off the ground before we did so, but that's, those are very good questions that need to be answered. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dodaro? Uh, uh, first of all, uh, Treasury had not uh, established yet a date for when they were going to start the program, and a lot of the program details aren't, aren't very clear yet. So it goes to the question of, of After a year, they aren't very clear? Well, that's, that was our, that's the status of, of it, and that's why we think uh, you know, the program hasn't got off and running. And it goes also to Congressman Ice's question. I mean, really, the second lien program, I think, needs to be established in addition to what they're doing, as well as dealing with negative equity, which is the hardest hit uh, housing fund that they're just now starting to get off the ground in five states. So you need multiple 
uh, approaches to deal with this problem because all the homeowners aren't in the same situation. Yeah, some they're, of them are employed, for example, and have a second lien. Some are going down the drain quickly, right. but could be caught with with the proper kind of, right. of net. And Treasury needs all these different programs to deal with the varying situations of the borrowers. So they need to get up and running. This is why we suggested they look at what how many people they had on board, on uh, on staff in order to carry out all these programs. And so, uh, but the basic answer to your question is, until the details are established, the servicers are going to be somewhat reluctant, and understandably, to sign up for the program. Mr. Taylor? Yeah, look, under the HAMP program, all the major lenders have signed up to participate in this program. And in, within the program, there is the permission to do principal write-down as well as interest write-down. The problem is, we now know it is really not working. And the fundamental reason it is not working is because it is voluntary. I mean, you have all these lenders sitting there waiting for you, the, the U.S. government and the taxpayer, to bail them out. And they are waiting for the, ta the, the, the taxpayer to pay for everything here. And what they ought to be doing is meet, at least meeting us halfway. So for that to happen, it has to be mandatory. Treasury has to say, okay, we are no longer going to have voluntary participation in this program. Everybody is going to do this. And if we have to use the authority on the top, which allows Treasury to purchase the loans, or the authority on the eminent domain, go in and get those loans. That is number one. Number two, right now, as we sit here, most of the problematic loans are actually already controlled by the government. Can you say Freddie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? Those are, those are no longer government sponsored enterprises. Those are government enterprises. And that is where the majority of these loans now sit. Tomorrow they can turn around and refinance millions of these loans. And if they don't, they stand to lose somewhere between $400 to $600 billion over the course of the next several years if they don't refinance now. But you have the capability. This Congress, this government has the capability to mandate Fannie and Freddie to turn around and fix those loans and mandate these Wall Street and big banks who have taken money from the American taxpayer and from this Congress and, and tell them that they're gonna, they are going to participate in this program. It is not that the program design is bad. It is the participation is bad. The gentlewoman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chafee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, th and thank you all for being here. I, I do appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Dodaro, I would like to go back to your July 20 um, uh, recommendations that were made uh, specific to the personnel. You know, one of the concerns about it in Treasury is, is lack of leadership. Um, you know, I just want to make sure I understand this, this right. The President goes out and announces this program in February, March, and they did not hire a Chief, owner, uh, chief Home Ownership Preservation Officer until November. Is that right? Yes, that's, that's correct. One of our recommendations, as you point out, was to get the head of that office established. I, I think one of the things that we want to have a response from Treasury on. You have such an important program. You got people bleeding over there. You know, the President stands up before the American people and says, This is going to happen. You can't even hire somebody until November. Now, my understanding was they uh, revised, they made a recommendation. They needed 36 full time equivalents uh, to, into the program. And then they modified that and said, No, we only need 29. We need less resources, not more resources. Um, but still haven't filled all 29 positions. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. I, you know, I just don't understand that. We hear all these complaints about this program. The taxpayers have set aside tens of billions of dollars, and we can't even find 29 people to administer the program? It takes the administration 10 months to hire a leader over there? That's inexcusable. And I hope on both sides of the aisle that we hold the administration accountable for that. Um, let me go to the second part of my questioning here. I, I'm, not a, I'm hearing a lot of numbers and I'm not understanding the math. And clearly the metrics have not been set up at the beginning. We're dealing with a very confused situation because the leadership was not in place and didn't set these metrics up in place. Help me understand here. We've only spent $58 million of the $75 billion. Is that right? That's correct because payments aren't made until the uh, trial modifications become permanent and there is a one-year anniversary of the trial modifications. Then, okay. the, then everybody gets, starts getting paid. So then they get paid at that point. Okay. Right. Because if you kind of do the math backwards, it was less than 400. Uh, okay. That makes much more sense. I appreciate that. If staff could put up um, slide five, if we have that. This is a letter from Timothy Geithner to Chairman Towns showing the, o the overdue trial modifications. There are 536,084 trial modifications that have been active four months or more 
and 287,881 trial modifications that have been active six months or more. Um, Mr. Borofsky, do they ha what is, I mean, what's causing this backlog? Verbal modifications. Uh, this is the result of, of not getting fully documented income verification, full documents at the outset of the, the mortgage modification process. That decision is what drove up the, the number in, in GAO's chart there of the spike of getting a high number of trial modifications, but without getting that documentation up front, you see them languishing five, six months because it takes that long for the documentation. Sometimes the documentation never will come, never could come, because the documents won't match up with the, the verbal numbers. Uh, I think that's one of the, the, the primary reasons why you see that, that those types of backlog. Okay, my time is short. We have votes. I, I, we obviously need more information and to ferret this out more. Um, and then, uh, Mr. Dardaro. This chart here, uh, I'm looking at the source. It says cumulative figures taken from January 10, HAMP uh, servicer per performance report. Monthly figures are GAO calculated using cumulative figures. If it's cumulative, why would trial modifications start to go down? I don't, if you could help clarify that for me. I see the permanent modifications starting continuing to go up, but if they are truly cumulative numbers, I don't understand why any number would ever come down. Monthly figures, okay. Yeah, those it are says those, cumulative, and I just well, uh, the, you can clarify that for me at it, some point. I think it's I calculated back from the cumulative figures, but it's on a monthly basis so that we could see the path. Okay. And I and I think you know the point being, even though the trial modifications are going down slightly because it's uh, now they've moved back to documented income up front, you may see a higher percentage of conversions to permanent modifications. But we'll have to wait and see. And then finally, there was, an, there was an assertion here that African Americans are 50 percent less likely. Why is that? Why, what, what, is, what is happening here? Why would that happen? I can't remember who brought that, that point up in the prior. Oh, I, I did. Do you want me to answer yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, they, they started out with disproportionately bad loans that, that were, you know, the, the subprime high cost lenders really targeted African American and Latino neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're starting with just a more difficult problem in terms of having to modify the, those loans to begin with. And let me just say on your. Gen I would think that the, the converse would be. Uh, gentleman's time has expired. Understood. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Right. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Congresswoman Watson. The question just came up about uh, African Americans and what's happening there. I would like to uh, just let you know in my district, I'm Los Angeles 33rd, Los Angeles and Culver City. I have 2,400 cases of uh, foreclosures in my district because of the subprime marketers. Uh, they would say, well, how much do you make? And then they said, well, $3,500. Well, let's mark it up to 5000 And then the payments in a few months go up and they can't afford. Then they lose their job on top of it. They have plagued my district, particularly the seniors and particularly uh, those at the lowest end of the socioeconomic pole. Uh, and it is just one of those situations that's almost bordering on the illegal. So uh, we have a big problem, and particularly in minority uh, communities, because they're the ones that can't find jobs, and they lose their jobs first. Now, with that being said, uh, Mr. Dodaro, according to the GAO's uh, July 2009 report, as of the third quarter of 2009, more than half of all modified loans redefaulted within six months and I'm finding within my district, and this can be documented, uh, we were trying to capitalize the banks, you know, too big to fail. They didn't give out. They didn't do the assistance to the homeowners that they should. However, in the HAMP program, only borrowers with high levels of household debt must agree to obtain debt counseling, and the Treasury Department is not adequately monitoring the requirement despite the fact that financial literacy is critical to ensuring that the mistakes which led to the current economic crisis are not repeated. And it's not all on the part of the home 
owner. And so what are the most common causes of redefault for HAMP borrowers and what steps is Treasury taking to prevent it? And should there be counseling for the borrower before they sign on the dotted line? And Mr. Dodaro. Yes. Uh, first, of the 170,000 permanent modifications that have been made under the first lien holder program in HAMP, 1,473 have redefaulted uh, so, so far. Now, on the counseling issue, Treasury requires borrowers over 55 percent or payment of their uh, monthly income, gr gross income, have to get counseling. But they are not following up and making sure that that counseling actually gets conducted. I am very disappointed uh, in, in their response uh, to that area. Uh, they believe it is not cost effective for them and the servicers to do that. Uh, there are ways to do it more cost effectively through, through follow-up activities. I think this is a m huge missed opportunity to deal with financial literacy, to deal with consumer education, uh, and I hope that uh, Treasury reconsiders uh, and uh, implements our recommendation. Uh, let me then address uh, my next comments to Mr. Barbarski and Mr. Uh, back to you, Mr. Uh, Daro. According to Treasury estimates, up to half of all borrowers at the risk of foreclosure have second liens on their property. And since having a second lien can result in much higher foreclosure rates, Treasury announced the second lien program on April the 28, 2009. However, in the past year, only two servicers have enrolled in the program and no second liens have been modified. Uh, why has the 2MP <coughs> excuse me, program not been effective this far and what more should the Treasury Department be doing to ensure the program successfully prevents foreclosures? You want to? On, on the uh, second lien program, we think you know, Treasury needs to make all the specific requirements known so that the servicers know what they are uh, signing up for. And so we think that that will help move that program uh, forward once that is done. You know what is very baffling to me, and I am sure many of mine, I will close with this, many of my colleagues, is how all of this started. You know, I was sitting here when Polsom and Bernanke came and said, help, help, the house is on fire. And, you know, what do you do? You call 911 and you get somebody out there. We are 911 and we got somebody out there to capitalize them so they could put out the fire and people could save their homes. It has not happened. And I think that Treasury is trying, but we still don't know. And the risk that we are taking is being paid for by the taxpayers and the seniors and the uninformed people are the victims. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you gentlemen from California. I now yield to the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Luke and Meyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, as I said here today, I'm, I'm you know, we, we, we're talking about a program here that's well intentioned, but is poorly thought out, thought through, poorly administered. And some of the comments here, Mr. Browski, program needed more planning up front. Mr. De Niro, program needs more stability. Mr. Calabrera, program has done more harm than good. Mr. Borowski, again, the voluminous paperwork causes delays. I think it's indicative of, of why we're sitting here and we wonder, well, we, we asked the government to come in and help, and yet the government is the one who can solve this problem. Uh, the lady from California talks about the house is on fire, you call 911. That's fine. You talk to the local fire department. You'll ask the government from Washington, D.C., who has to drive plumb, plumb across the country to put out a fire. I think we've got the wrong people in charge here. This is a this is, this is frustrating to me. Um, as we sit here, um, Mr. Borowski, uh, in, in looking at uh, something here, it says that the Treasury has not monitored the requirement that borrowers with high levels of household debt obtain debt counseling. I mean, if we are looking at folks who are going to try and rewrite their mortgage, is it, why, why are we not doing that? Why, why, is, it, why is it the Treasury not, or is there some sort of enforcement provision here that will force them to start doing it now? or is, is this going to just be blown off and be forgotten about like some of these other things that we are talking about? I am going to refer to my colleague because I, I think oh, okay. that finding is part of his, right. his report. Uh, 
Uh, what Treasury's uh, told us, they've uh, consulted with the servicers, and they think it would be too uh, costly to track that provision. And I, I, I don't uh, buy that as an acceptable answer. I think it should be uh, followed up on. There should be cost-effective ways to find out whether the counseling is done or not. I think it's integral and important, particularly if we're looking at the trying to reduce the uh, occurrences of redefaults uh, going forward and to make sure that the borrowers are empowered with the best information that is available to them and they're making informed decisions and choices. Uh, so I, I would hope, as I said, the Treasury reconsiders, implements our recommendations, and if not, I would encourage the Congress to uh, make it uh, mandatory. Who pays for the debt counseling? Is that something that is included in the, the, the charges that the individual pays here, or the, the, do we pay for that? The, the, does program pay for that? Or who pays for the counseling? It's, uh, I'll, I'll have to get back to you with Mr. that Mr. Taylor, answer. you look yeah, like you yeah, know the answer. Yeah, well, HUD pays for HUD certified counselors. Some of the banks pay for the counseling. I don't know if the program, is NeighborWorks, of course, is funded by this Congress. They, they fund a lot of the organizations. So there are, there are, there are other outside they, they, sources that pay for they it? They want to help. In, in fact, the, 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 under the FTC requirement, uh, whenever a, a person goes in for a modification, they're supposed to be informed of, and the, of the availability of uh, of counseling. The problem is in the survey we just did, the mystery shopping of 100 services, we found out that 80% uh, of the time they are not told about it. And so, Congressman, not, yeah. uh, it, uh, uh, my staff informs me that HUD pays for the counseling on okay. this program. Okay. All right. Mr. Caliber. Right. If I could come and just say, I've, my recollection is we have probably uh, appropriated four to five hundred million over this uh, course of action for counseling. So there's a significant amount of money out there and despite the characterization of my testimony saying doing nothing, my testimony quite frankly suggests that one of the things we do need to do is connect counseling to the labor market. For instance, I talk about in my testimony that mass layoffs are an, uh, have very large effects, disproportionate effects on the housing market because somebody loses their job and there's a big impact on the housing market. And one of the things that can be done, for instance, is connecting counseling counselors to the employers so that, you know, the last day of work where you've got 50 people on the factory floor, you can give them financial assistance, financial counseling, literacy right then and there because you know if you lose your job in the mass layoff, you are likely six months, nine months down the road to get into financial trouble. One of the things I would continue to emphasize, we cannot just sort of wait till the horse is out of the barn door. You need to get people on the front end before they get in financial trouble and avoid this to start with. Uh, you made the comment about $400,000 per modification. Can you explain that figure? Uh, let me say, as the Congressman pointed out, that was in the assumption of the if that we spent this $75 billion. I certainly hope that we spent it a whole lot more effectively. So that was simply, this is, the, this is the, how much we are on, how much we've appropriated, essentially, divided by how many people we are likely to Would help. Would you anticipate helping? That I anticipate helping. Be cheaper to write them a check, wouldn't it? Uh, cheaper to buy them a house. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, Mr. Taylor, you mentioned something a minute ago. Uh, you wanted the banks to meet you halfway. Can you explain that comment, please? Sure. So, uh, you know, there, there aren't a lot of clean, clean hands in this whole debacle. And certainly the role that Wall Street played uh, it cannot be overstated. So the solution to this must be a principal write-down program. The answer to resolving this crisis is we've got to get the monthly payments down. Interest alone is not working. You heard Representative Izzo talk about, Izzo, excuse me, talk about the Bank of America's initiative. I know that Citibank and some of the other banks, at least in some of their portfolio lending, Wells, Wells on the loans that they have in portfolio, we're beginning to see some principal write-downs. That's what's going to put people in a position, those who are still working, to be able to continue to pay on their mortgage. So. I think without that kind of initiative, um, I don't see that we're going to make a lot of progress. And who as puts long the bill for that? The banks time come again. Who puts the bill for that? Well, the, 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 who fits the bill is the folks who kind of created this crisis in the first place, Wall Street and the big banks, reduce the principal. And then what the government can do is step in and act as a guarantor for the balance, but get it down to some reasonable amount where you're going to keep the families in the house and eventually the equity appreciation over time will we'll bring value back to the homeowner. So it's, uh, it's the industry stepping up and, and matching, at least, the government's initiative here. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. time has expired. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Congresswoman Chu. Well, I have a constituent, uh, Daisy Cardiel, whose parents are on the brink of losing their home to an auction in less than a week. They applied in the HAMP trial period plan for three months, and they entered into uh, that with J.P. Morgan Chase. They submitted their payments timely each month, but during that time period, they hardly received any feedback on what was going on, any status updates or anything. And then finally, five months later, they, they received a letter from Chase indicating that they were denied and that their house was going to be auctioned off in 30 days, even though they had faithfully made their payments. And it's, the system has to be better than this. this th here they were put on a string for, for uh, five months, and now it's going to be auctioned off almost immediately. Um, I'm concerned about the lack of notice, but also about the lack of an appeal process. And um, uh, while with the introduction of borrower notices on January 1st, 2010, homeowners are finally able to see at least a reason for a modification denial. But um, I'd like to ask Mr. Taylor, does the introduction of borrower notices do enough to ensure that HAMP eligible homeowners can appeal an unfair denial? I, I think it would be helpful. I, do, I, I wouldn't say that it does enough. And I think what you're really getting at with, and, and, and interestingly enough, from both sides of the aisles, we've heard examples of people who are trying to uh, avoid a foreclosure, who are still working, uh, going to the HAMP program and then be, being in the process and, and still not having any success. So it, like the example you just gave, I hate to say it's not very uncommon, but let's really look at where the problem lies. The Treasury would love to see those loans become permanent modifications, but the servicer and the lender has to agree to that. So if somebody fills out all the applications and does, submits all the information, applies for the modification, and three months go by, five months go by, and it looks like everything's fine, and then all of a sudden they get a foreclosure notice, and again, not uncommon. If, if we can't if we can't get the servicer and the and the loan the the bank itself to agree to make that modification treasury loses as well as the rest of us so again it's a voluntary participation program there has to be a mandatory participation so so that the lender isn't sitting there going well i'll just string this along long enough to see whether maybe equity grows in the property maybe foreclosure is a better uh, option and for, for most banks it isn't but uh, and, and maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll just postpone um, the foreclosure process on this and see if I have a better deal at the end. There needs to be, like, I have to do this because it's now mandatory. We'll get more folks. Obviously, this doesn't get to the unemployment, but there are solutions for unemployment, including what Bonnie Frank has offered, as, as a, and, and I really urge members of this committee to take a look at the bill that he's put forward to help people who are on unemployment. That will help them. Uh, temporarily remain in the house either to, to find work or to be able to refinance or to, or to be, a, uh, sorry, to, or to sell their home. So I don't think the notification is enough. I think it will be helpful. I think we've got to have mandatory participation in this program so we don't have these three, five, six months of stringing people along only to find out that they're still going to foreclose anyway. Yes. I might say right now there is no formal appeal process. You know, we believe one's needed. There needs to be a due process uh, available uh, to people to be able to do it and to have some standards and remedies for people that aren't complying with the requirements. So we're looking at that right now. I appreciate that. And um, what recourse do homeowners have if they believe they were unfairly denied, denied a trial or a permanent modification before January 1st, 2010? Very little. That's it, then. Yeah. And um, Mr. Taylor, can you expand on, on the unemployed situation? Uh, I know in one of your recommendations you talked about the loan program for the unemployed. Right. So, uh, you know, Mr. Calabria is right that, you know, one of the major con <laughs> I'm not going to say that more than once, so <laughs> you'll have to watch it on the video. Uh, but the uh, the fact of the matter is that um, uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry about that. Um, Loan program for the unemployed. Yes, yes. The fact of the matter is that it is the the single growing, single most uh, number one reason now we're seeing most of the foreclosures. Um, 
there are alternatives. Citibank, for example, has proposed a six-month uh, moratorium, uh, what they call unemployment assist, which would actually allow the people who are on unemployment to pay 31 percent of their unemployment check towards their monthly cost for six months. This is a pretty generous, I think, helpful thing that ought to be standard in the industry so that people have time to find work or have time to find a way out of that home to be able to sell it. Uh, Bonnie Frank and his committee has proposed, I don't have the bill number in front of me, but uh, essentially a program that is going to assist people financially to be able to stay in their homes for a period of time again where they can either find gainful employment or be able to sell their home. But both of those, I think, are reasonable, reasonable rational solutions to try to deal with the growing contribution that the unemployment uh, problem has to the foreclosure crisis. The gentlewoman's time has expired. The gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Is it Calabria? I want to I want to thank you. In a town uh, uh, that we keep hearing people need to be more, more um, uh, bipartisan, you were very bipartisan by blaming both the present and the past administration. Um, on, on this item. And I just say in the spirit of bipartisanship, I think a lot of this we've got to recognize wasn't just, Mr. Taylor, um, Wall Street, but we're, we were really at fault too, I think, in the fact that you had bipartisan effort here. You had one side feeling that we're going to push this almost as a social program, that everybody owning their own house was going to be a great social experiment. And those of us in the, on, on the other side seeing that um, home ownership does re uh, is reflected in political activity, a different um, involvement in community, whatever. And I think Democrats and Republicans politically have a fault here. And I guess our fault was the feeling that a good thing uh, pushed too far is not a problem. And I think that history has proven uh, just as the consumer pushed too far, I think the political process and the economic people that say, look, you can make money doing this by selling this product to this group, we just keep expanding the market just by um, lowering the standard in the thresholds. Um, I, I think we are all at fault and, and got pulled into this. And I, and I think, as Greenspan said, who would have thought? Um, my big question here is no one's talking about a flip side on this. I am hearing in San Diego that there are people out there ready to buy and take these short um, these sales take these loans over, take over the, um, the home. Uh, but because we're caught in this system that takes so long, there's massive amounts of market out there that's not available for the free market to take over these debts. Um, anybody got any answers there, any comments on that? Because I think that we're not talking about, you know, the, there's the keep the person in the home, figure out how to make them pay. You pointed out the greatest threat is the jobs. What do you do with somebody who's not going to have the job for the next year, do you continue to carry this and is this the way to go or do we also get the other option that the person with the job who doesn't have a home, who would like to buy, take over the, 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 the payments, isn't being allowed to access the market because it's basically being frozen by this process. You had a comment about that, Mr. Uh, I was going to, I mean, I think what we really need is we essentially need two processes. We need a process for people who it's sustainable. They hit a bump in the road. We can fix that. But we really need a process. I mean, John mentioned you'd have people who are, uh, you know, they go through modifications six months later. It doesn't last. We don't do them any favors keeping them in that situation. So I would say on one end, we actually are better off trying to get that through the process. Uh, and certainly lots of places in California, for instance, it's cheaper to rent the comparable home. Absolutely. And I would say it's not just me. Dean Baker, who's a you know, well-known progressive economist, has made this argument that you're better off helping many of these families become renters because they pay twice as much in their home. So that said, I do think you need a different process for people who it's, there's, there's no way that they're going to be able to sustain that home and we should stop pretending. And then for people who can, and you need, you need to take them on a different track. Uh, I guess I would say as a general overall, I don't think we're doing the housing market a favor trying to blow the bubble back up. You know, the best thing we can ultimately do is to let the prices correct and people will come into that market because one of the big problems with this is one of the incentives for the bank, for instance, in this net present value test and for the homeowner is not simply house prices today, but house prices tomorrow. And even if you did a write down to where, you know, there are the mortgage is at the value of the house, 
Well, if the, more, if the house value declines another 10% over the next year, then they're underwater again. So we need to make sure these things actually work the first time rather than continue and try to chase this. Mr. Taylor? I, yeah, thank you. I, I don't know where to begin on this one, but let me first say we have 11 months of inventory, uh, vacant housing, 11 months uh, of uh, usually normally in, in the economy it's two, three months of, of vacant housing. We're, we're piled full of vacant housing that's available for renting. And I agree that that is a viable and, and sensible option for many people. But remember when we just say that just let the market correct and, and, and put this more inventory out there, first off, it kills the building industry. That's one thing. That's one of the reasons we have such a high job loss. But the second thing is, remember that every one of these keys represents a family, a household, who thought they were getting into a feasible loan. Less than 10 percent of the people who got these bad loans, less than 10 percent went to people getting new homes. Most of the stuff was refinancing or taking money out. Let so, me interrupt. You're right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. But a, a lot of this was, there was the market it was sold as a way of making money too. It was yes. a way of you. Yes. This is a great investment. Now you and I know that does doesn't exist within right. the foreseeable Pay off your future. Credit cards. I mean, all, all these other things. And right. the big one is: Are we politically brave enough to say, "Look, there's a lot of people that got into this looking to make a profit. That profit's not going to be out there." Mm -hmm. And the fact is, it's much more cost-effective for them to rent than to continue to grab for something that will never have the profit that they originally made and basically cut the losses, move forward, and actually be ahead if they don't continue. Are we politically brave enough to, to admit that? If, if I could come in on that. I, I think the political bravery is also to recognize that there are millions of American families who are hardworking, blue-collar families who simply suffered from, what it, for whatever reason you want to believe, whether you think they bit, bit off too, mu too much or whether the market gave them a loan that they shouldn't have gotten. It doesn't matter. Do well, I think, we, it's, I think it's both. I think we can agree okay, that it's probably okay. both. Do, 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 does it matter that we try to keep as many of these homeowners in their homes as possible? Does it matter to us as, as people, as members of Congress? Does it matter to the economy? And it absolutely, the answer is absolutely yes. If we continue to watch these foreclosures mount, and become more rental properties available, we will continue to watch a devaluation of property values for all Americans' housing and, a, and, a, and an undermining. Mr. Chairman, I think they missed the point, though. I am being told quite openly mm -hmm. that there are, there are individuals who would like to get into this market, but because of the way we are dragging this off, and this right. gets back to this not giving answers, not being able to close either yes or no in the line, that the other option of being bought out of the hole is not being made available, and it's the government program's delay that you're talking about, Mr. Taylor, yeah. that's leading to this other option we go into. Because I think you agree, if it was your children, if it was your friend, you'd say it's better. You, it's better for you in the long run to get out of some of these deals. It's you know, oh, it's I'm not sorry. just an abstract. Thank you. Yeah, the gentleman's time has expired. The gentlewoman from Ohio. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Captain. Chairman. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Borofsky, and to all of our excellent witnesses today. Um, I um, have a little statement I want to make, but my question to all of you will be, what would be your top recommendation to President Obama and Secretaries Geithner and Donovan to address stabilization and recovery in our housing market and banking system? So you have made a lot of recommendations. I am asking you to sort through them for me. But let me just make a comment that those Wall Street speculators who rigged our housing market to earn huge profits for a very long time through securitization have got Congress just where they want us. They have got us playing with twigs when the forest is burning. And the perpetrators are still making huge profits, taking obscene bonuses and laughing all the way to their brokers, and I have no doubt laughing at all of us. Some of our colleagues are trying to make this a partisan issue. Um, I don't look at it that way. I am very critical of the massive Wall Street investment houses in cahoots with the Federal Reserve that led us into this abyss. And our Federal Government was full of top-level appointees over several administrations who came from those very same institutions making all the money. This crisis is due to a revolving door of influence peddling of extraordinary proportion. It goes back two decades regardless of who was President and regardless of who sat in this Congress. 
Wall Street simply used its power with a vengeance, and they still are. Uh, Mr. Taylor, I want to thank you for your testimony. You speak for the American people who have been harmed. You speak for the people of my district. Your voice is very clear, and it is very important. One of the questions I have of you, and then we'll open it up to the other witnesses here, you produced the keys this morning. Um, let me ask you this. To your knowledge, could each family who had one of those keys, would the institution that financed their loan during a foreclosure proceeding be able to produce the original note in that proceeding or only a copy or some sort of facsimile of it? And what is your opinion about the legality of that in foreclosure proceedings? Well, of course, the courts have ruled that they do need to produce those documents, several state courts. Uh, are several, in several states, they have ruled that they need to produce the uh, certificate of ownership. And, they, and some of these, uh, many of these financial institutions have had difficulty doing that because, well, here is a loan that New Century made. Here is a loan that Option One made. Here's a loan that AmeriQuest made. Here's a loan that Countrywide made. And it goes on and on and on, all these businesses which no longer exist. And when, as they sold off these things through this, you know, Ponzi scheme involving Wall Street to just move all this paper out from local communities and brokers and, and lenders, uh, the certificate of ownership did not trail them. They just kept moving the paper and moving the profits and everybody taking fees along the way. So. Uh, Generally, if you or I were, were suing somebody for anything and we were claiming that, you know, I had the right and the ownership over this, we would have to produce something for the court that's, that, in fact, signifies that. And the fact that they can't ought to stop the proceeding unless and until they're able to do that. Yes. And why aren't our judges doing that across the country? Do they well, not know the law? <laughs> why aren't the judges doing it? Well, some judges are, I'm, I'm happy to say, in different circuits. But uh, for those states, for governors and elected officials who are looking to try to prevent the, f the level of foreclosures that continue to rise in their, in their congressional dis districts, they might want to send a letter to the judges to inform them about Sir, this Sir, if legality. I could see, I hope you go address the National Sheriff's Association. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a job that your organization could do to get this word out, because I think we have to fight back yeah. uh, it, with every weapon we have. Um, and. Um, there isn't much time for the other panelists to answer at this point, but I very much would appreciate top recommendation that you right now to address the concerns that you brought before us today. Well, our, our unadopted recommendation in this report is reexamining the, the vulnerability of this program to redefault. Uh, and I, I do think that's essential, and Treasury has, has indicated they will not, uh, without doing so, uh, that the program is going to be vulnerable to one where mortgages are, even those that, may, that make permanent modifications, may drop out with a total waste of taxpayer money and even potentially harming some of those homeowners. So I think reassessing and evaluating and, and coming up with ideas to address the vulnerabilities to redefault would be, very quickly, would be, would be the unanswered recommendation in our report. Mr. Barofsky, I would also appreciate from you an evaluation of Franklin Roosevelt's Homeowners Loan Corporation. Several members have sent a letter over to Secretary Geithner asking him to take a look at that. I hear what you are saying to me about the existing program. The existing program is a failure. We have to look at other structures that we need to recommend to the administration. And I would be very va your, your experience, your knowledge would be very valuable to us if you are able to do that within your authority. Uh, I would say because economic circumstances are different different parts of the country, borrowers are in different circumstances, top recommendation would be to, for Treasury is to institute the other facets of their program, the second lien modification, the mortgage alternative program, the uh, hardest hit program which begins to deal with some negative equity and deal with people who have lost their jobs. So you need a range of alternatives. Right now the only one is the second lien or, excuse me, first lien program, you need more options. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Clay. Thank you, Chairman Clay. Uh, Mr. Borofsky, uh, your, your audit is uh, very forthright. This is just, this is a failure. This program is a failure and it's a waste of taxpayer dollars. Uh, but there are interesting insights. What, what did you discover about this modification program in terms of homeowners who get temporary modifications but then uh, fail to get the permanent uh, workout? 
Yes, yeah, so we, we believe a lot of this is being, um, and, and one of the problems about redefault and the reasons for redefault is that Treasury hasn't yet been collecting data. They're going to be collecting data in 2010. Um, but we believe that one of the primary reasons for this was the absence of documented, fully documented um, verification of income at the outset of the program. Treasuries uh, encouraging in order to meet certain mileposts for trial modifications uh, was encouraging these verbal modifications. And I think that has, has fueled a, a lot of what you're discussing, the, the, the reason why they're not being converted and dropping out. So verbal modification. So basically stated income. Yes. Which is, uh, I, I believe, from uh, the rhetoric of this administration, which is exactly what got us into this with the subprime marketplace is how much do you make? Well, yeah. whatever you say you make. And so in essence, gov the government policy has been able to, has been to take uh, private sector subprime loans and make them public sector subprime loans. There is a similarity to the, the, the liar loans uh, that I investigated as a mortgage fraud prosecutor. So very similar? Uh, similar in, the, it, it, in entering into the trial portion of the program just on stated income. It didn't work then. It's not working now. Um, and, and look, to Treasury's credit, they, they've identified that it's not working. And as of April 15th, they'll no longer be accepting verbal modifications. But it was one of the driving causes of this huge backlog and, and low numbers of conversions. Okay, so your audit also uh, says that those that get a permanent workout have a very high risk of default. We don't know what the risk is, but we do think that it's vulnerable for redefault. It is a uh, there are there are several aspects of the program that make it vulnerable to redefault, uh, and that is a real danger of this program for its long-term success. Such as, um, well, for example. You know, negative equity is, is one of the highest predictors of redefault. And the, the average HAMP modification, the loan is underwater. And you know, as if left unaddressed, along with the other, other factors, um, there is, you know, the statistics show that, that negative equity can lead to high areas of redefault. Also, the, the amount of whether these payments will ultimately be, still be affordable. Uh, the, the percentages and the models don't account for other debt. Uh, crushing credit card debt and other debt that may make even a modified payment unaffordable. Also, the structure of the program is that it's, we call them permanent modifications, but they're not permanent. They last for five years, and then the interest rate starts to reset, a lot like some of the, the subprime loans that, that you were referring to earlier. Um, and in, we just give one example where within a couple of years at the end of the program, uh, the payment could go up as much 23 percent, which again will put pressure on potential redefault if the income doesn't go up in, in, in a commensurate amount. Okay, and what did your audit find about the Treasury's pressure on servicers to modify these loans? Well, we had one servicer who responded that based on the public pressure um, that was that Treasury was exerting to increase trial modifications, uh, that they changed their they changed the way that they did business. They went from doing um, docu fully documented modifications to, to verbal. Mr. Dodaro in his testimony today, um, they in GAO, and I, again, I don't want to speak for GAO, he could speak on this, but, but they've indicated very similar types of patterns. And I'll, I'll defer to my colleague to explain that. Certainly. Yeah, ba basically, uh, the uh, ratio of high debt to income is a predictor uh, of, of redefaults. And part of the requirements in the Treasury was to get those particular borrowers with high ratios like that into counseling to help them understand the situation. And, and this is one recommendation that we've made to Treasury that they haven't yet implemented. We think it's important and really will help address as best as possible uh, this question of trying to minimize or read the faults, as, long, as well as having this uh, uh, mortgage alternative program available. So up front, if the decision is made going forward, that the trial modification doesn't make sense, there's a smooth exit strategy for short sales or other purchases to get, move the, uh, you know, help the borrower get reallocated. And that's not a part of current Treasury policy? Uh, that program has been in the works but not yet implemented. That program, the second lien program, and this other one on hardest hit areas of fund are not operational yet and need to be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. Uh, we will now uh, recognize Ms. Spear of California Five Minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of the witnesses for appearing here today. 
Now, listening to this testimony is, is very discouraging. I think of this program as a program of death by a thousand cuts. It has failed. It has failed miserably. And unfortunately, we are incapable of saying, all right, this was an experiment. It didn't work. Let's try something else. And we just start layering more and more regulations, more and more elements to it. Half of all the foreclosures are negative equity loans right now. Half of them have already redefaulted. Half of them have second liens. And in this program, we don't consider non-mortgage debts as a factor in the modified payment. We are setting ourselves up for failure. The program doesn't work. Now, on top of everything else, it's voluntary. And let me give you an example from my district. This is a homeowner in Daly City. He had an IndyMac loan of $609,000 with a 6.75 percent interest, a payment of $3,500 a month. He works at FedEx. He's had a steady job there, but they have reduced his hours. He lives and takes care of his 89-year-old mother, lives with her, at, who, and his mother is a survivor of three breast cancers. He qualifies for making home affordable and has made all the trial plan payments on time. Confirm delivery and contacts them biweekly to be sure that they have everything they need. And yet, they are still not converting his loan to a permanent modification, and they have set a date for sale of that home for April 7th. Now, that is a travesty, an absolute travesty. I'm suggesting that we scrap this program, put all of these people who are in foreclosure, in a rental status, in their homes, with the banks, create some kind of you know, lease with option to buy, take that money that we've set aside for this program, subsidize the banks if necessary to keep them in their homes, wait this out for a year or two, and see if we can create a means by which they not only continue to live in their homes, but they can recreate some kind of equity in their homes moving forward. Now, that's just one idea of what there may be many. And my question to all of you is, if this gentleman in Daly City who's doing it right, who's in a trial modification program, who has made the payments on a hefty loan, is having his home put up for sale in a matter of weeks, how can we say this program has any positive effect at all? Question to all of you. I, I, I think you hit the nail right on the head that, you know, whether this program can be saved or whether a new program needs to be instituted, there has to be a reevaluation. There has to be some self-reflection. There has, Treasury needs to take a look at why these problems are occurring, where the dangers are, and make informed decisions. And that's a lot of what we've been talking about today, whether it's, you know, their refusal to, to reevaluate for redefault, uh, our recommendation, or something as simple as setting uh, goal posts and you know meaningful goals and measuring performance against those goals because if you don't do that you can't have that type of self reflection that that self assessing of, of how to fix it so I, I think that you know the concerns that you raise are similar to the concerns that we raise um, and it, Treasury is going to need to take a good hard look at this program look at these concerns and decide if they want to continue this program if it is fixable or whether to try something on, in the alternative. I, I Oh, uh, first, you need to explore other alternatives, and, I, and we, we agree with that. And we think some of the other alternatives that Treasury has been planning are viable and should be tried as well. Uh, but you have 800,000 people in these active trial modifications right now that need to be dealt with equitably. They entered into this in good faith, uh, and they need to be dealt with. They don't have an appeal process if they're running into difficulty. We think they need an appeal process. There needs to be good communication. There needs to be uh, the servicers held for compliance. I mean, we sort of set this in motion. We can't abandon it without properly treating these people in this, in this period. But you need other alternative programs, and certainly that needs to be uh, addressed. And your idea, among others, or, or, or need to be explored. Your point about an appeal process is, is helpful. It would be helpful to this constituent of mine. But again, the whole system is so arbitrary. It's voluntary and it's arbitrary and it's not working. So 
I mean, I can see where we need to take care of those who are in some trial modification, but this gentleman is in a trial modification. His house is being sold from out from under him. Uh, uh, all I can say is that's why we made recommendations to the Treasury last July to put these processes in place and to make sure there was a compliance program with the providers. I mean, I'm not sure what the specifics are here, you know, obviously, uh, but there needs to be a process in place so that people are dealt with in a due process fashion and they get good answers and they have uh, uh, somewhere to go for help. There is a hotline now they can call, but that hasn't proven to always work effectively. The gentlewoman's time has expired. Gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank our witnesses. You know, coming from a large Midwestern city, with much of it being inner city, I can't tell you the number of foreclosures that exist in many of the communities that I represent. But as I've listened to the testimony, I was struck by the recommendations that the general lady from California made, and I think she would have been an excellent Secretary of the Treasury, or at the very least, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. And that's because I believe very, very strongly in the concept that if you start with a faulty premise, you're going to arrive at a faulty conclusion. And I think many of the concepts in this program were faulty from the beginning. And so it was inevitable that it becomes the failure that people are expressing or that we're not experiencing any more success with it than what we are experiencing. I also don't believe that you can defend the indefensible, that you simply are going around and around and around and around in circles. But let me ask you, Mr. Borowski, who is the typical HAMP participant? I mean, who is the typical homeowner facing foreclosure who attempts to make use of the program? I'm not able to answer that question, but I think that that is a question that, uh, that, that many have raised. The Congressional Oversight Panel raised this issue in their October report, um, and, and, and it goes to the very question of is this program designed, who is this program designed to help? Is it the homeowner who signed up for a, a predatory loan with a resetting option arm that reset to, to 8 or 9 percent and an increase of $3,000 a month, or is it the, the the hardworking family that, that perhaps had a, a, even a prime fixed rate um, mortgage but lost their job and are unable to, to, to make necessary payments. Um, but I think, it, I think it's an important question. We have you know, the medium information, how much you know, the, the medium loan and what the, the medium interest rate and the medium deduction, but I don't think that's really what your, what your question is asking. Are there, are there ceilings, uh, uh, floors? I mean, I, I know people who've got mortgages of $350,000 who earn $65,000, $70,000 a year. And of course, for the sake of me, I couldn't imagine how they managed to acquire that. And the question, is there any salvation for them to salvage whatever it is they've put into this and get out of it. Mr. Taylor, would, would, would you respond? Yes. Uh, the, uh, the, the average, uh, let me just say that the, the typical person going through the program is all ethnicities, mostly modest income, um, disproportionately older, uh, older being 50 and older, and uh, most with families with children. Um, the, 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 on your second question, um, the, 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 the high mortgage. Yeah, so, so yes, sorry. The, the, abil the way the program is designed is to get the housing cost down to 31 percent of the household income. That's the goal. So the, the two methods for that to happen is for the servicer or the lender to reduce either interest, principal, or both. The problem is that 
Most of what has occurred has been interest deduction, and we now understand we are not going to get very far without principal reduction. The other alternative for the family you presented is some sort of a patient, you know, non foreclosure uh, scenario where they have time to be able to either sell their home uh, or, uh, or to find uh, additional employment which could ratchet up their income to be able to handle that size of mortgage. But those are the two methods that are available. One of the, be available. When the crisis hit, I mean, one of the recommendations that some of the community groups and people really tempted to deal made was that, you know, you, you, you try and keep people in a property mm -hmm. because if you actually foreclose on it, everybody loses right. in that transaction. That is, the property loses its value, whatever value it had in a relatively short period of time. In many of the communities that I represent, if somebody moves out of one in two weeks, it's decimated. I mean, whatever was there is gone. So this question of, of working out agreements where people might be able to rent until they reach the point where they can actually pay a mortgage or if there's a possibility of not only salvaging what they've put in, but the property, the asset itself, how does that I idea approach. Well, I think you're absolutely right. I think we are all impacted by continuing continuing mounting foreclosures. We all lose. People who are paying on their mortgage, who have a prime mortgage, have no problem paying their mortgage. They watch the, their household value, their house value continue to deteriorate every time there's a foreclosure uh, within a block of their, their house. Then when you have multiple foreclosures, there's a rapid decline in value. So. We are all losing, as I said earlier, roughly $7 trillion in, in uh, home equity has been lost by the American public. So I, I don't agree with the Congresswoman from California about let, let's just let them all fail and, you know, uh, a year later we will sort of pick up the pieces. Let's find some rental situations. I think if we allow another 8 million homes to go into foreclosure, it will have a devastating, devastating effect on our economy and the job losses will continue to rise. Let me thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I agree with you because I believe that wherever there is a will, there is a way, mm -hmm. and that if we would have the courage to make the kind of decisions that need to be made, we could, in fact, salvage many of these properties, turn them around, and salvage everything that people have put into them. Mm -hmm. So I thank you for this hearing, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, and thank the gentleman. I. Uh, you know, every day I, I hear from constituents uh, who are among the over 4 million Americans who are going through foreclosure and uh, are facing pending foreclosure and suffering with underwater home values. Uh, just this month, foreclosure rates hit an all-time record high uh, in St. Louis in my hometown. Uh, Mr. Taylor, uh, just this week the National Urban League reported uh, that blacks and other people of color are suffering from the housing crisis at far higher rates than whites, and yet according to your research, uh, you report racial disparities in that minority bar borrowers are less likely than whites to receive trial and permanent modifications. Uh, can you explain your methods and these findings further? Yes. Um, essentially, we have a dual system of mortgage finance in this country, one for whites and one for blacks. And it is really unfair. And if most people really understood just how unfair it is, most, most Americans really think we should not tolerate it. I mean, Make no mistake about it, communities, black and brown communities were targeted by subprime high cost lenders after the banks had left and abandoned those neighborhoods and closed their branches. So that we're, and let's face it, when we're talking about minority, whether it's black or brown, we're still talking about people who are working, you know, and people, you know, perhaps their income isn't as high, but they're people who are working, they have families, they have all the same hopes and dreams of any other uh, family in America. The available basic banking services for that population are payday lenders, check cashes, and pawn shops. That's a disgrace. 
The available mortgage lenders are these fly-by-night options uh, or fly-by-night independent companies that set up the little shops and advertise low rates and whatever and tease people in with these rates only to give them you know, loans that are totally inappropriate, that they know are unsustainable. That is what really happened. And, and now people trying to get out of those situations, even now under the mortgage modification programs that are available, are still even now being disproportionately treated along racial lines. And can you surmise that um, uh, from this data, uh, from the steering that occurred, mm -hmm. steering people of color into subprime and predatory loans mm -hmm. contributed to the housing crisis that we are experiencing now. Yes. I mean, that what you see, uh, the average, a typical neighborhood seven years ago in America would see one or two percent subprime loans. But you would go into African American and Hispanic communities and you would see, I'm not exaggerating, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of the mortgages made in those neighborhoods were high cost, subprime, unsustainable loans. And I see it in middle class neighborhoods in my district in North St. Louis County. Mm -hmm. I see that and, and these people are pretty much middle income earners. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you, do, do you have any suggestions? I on do. how we close the racial gap. Well, first off, there's, there's nothing like sunshine uh, to, to show what is occurring and being very crystally clear about the difference in treatment and who's getting what, who's not getting what, who's being offered mm -hmm. the types of loans. So there's no question that the ability to produce data has, has elevated the conversation and the ability to make assessments in this area, but a lot more needs to be done. Even in the HAMP and the HOP programs, it's very difficult to get data from these people, which drives me crazy because these are government agencies and there's no proprietary stuff about this. Why aren't they sharing this data with this committee and with everybody else, the GAO and everybody else, so we can really analyze what's going on? That's one of the things that ought to happen. But the, the recommendation that I would make, uh, first, we, we really need to revisit the issue of judicial modification to protect people from losing their homes. Secondly, um, take away the voluntary aspect of HAMP, make it mandatory, but lenders have to participate, there has to be principal write down and interest write down. Instruct Fannie and Freddie tomorrow to refinance the millions of loans that they have on their books, that they have the capability and authority to do right now, to refinance those loans into workable, sustainable Those, those sub, subprime and predatory loans. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Of which the, the estimates that they have somewhere between 400 to 600 billion dollars worth of those loans are four to five million. Um, use all these vacant houses as a job creation program, mm -hmm. all these foreclosures, you know, begin to train people to become carpenters, plumbers, electricians, sheet metal workers, roofers, and so on, to rehabilitate a lot of these homes which, as somebody pointed out earlier, become abandoned, become a, a, a stress on the local uh, government and local community. Mm -hmm. Train people to rehabilitate and bring, and bring up to code and even weatherize these programs. That will create jobs and at the same time create decent affordable housing and affordable rental housing. Mm -hmm. The Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, which has been offered, I mean, this House passed a bill and I applaud it for its version, but unfortunately the Senate has undermined your initiative by taking the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau and putting it in the Federal Reserve and then putting oversight of the bank regulators, the very people who failed to enforce all the laws and regulations we had to prevent this kind of calamity, are now going to be the oversight board and, and, and be able to veto and control what comes out of that bo board. I hope you guys really fight in this conference committee when the Senate's done weakening this, this legislation that you really fight to create a, a meaningful consumer finance protection board. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see it publicized on television and mm -hmm. to see just who's shilling for who. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. This panel is dismissed. Too bad it wasn't just you and me. <laughs> that bad <laughs> guy agree. I expected them to get one of the questions, I guess. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I'll just throw them in there. Thank you.